you know, Leonardo da Vinci's like anatomical sketch pages. And it would just show like these skulls and these muscles. And then it was all this writing and all these little, little sketches on the sides. And I was like, this guy is awesome. And then I saw the Mona Lisa and I was like, that's boring. Like you, I learned about reptiliatus. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like watching his Instagram reels. And I just, instead of me thinking like, oh shoot, I need to get some of my own dart frogs. I was like, how about I just like spend a couple hours nature journaling his dart frogs. These are pretty common now, but this is essential oh, cool. because you don't have to carry water with you and it allows you to do everything standing up. So I can be standing, I can be in a tree, on a canoe, um, kneeling, lying on my stomach, um, anything like that. Um, that is incredible. It looks it looks cumbersome to the person that, <laughs> that that's watching. Like, I just got so much going on. I can't believe how well you can draw and paint while doing all of that. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I am speaking with Marley Pfeiffer. Now, I absolutely love this episode. As you guys know, I'm always searching for ways to help keepers re-engage in herpetoculture in ways that doesn't involve going out and buying a new animal. We all get stuck in that cycle of wanting a new species, going out and buying it, and we can get stuck in that vicious cycle. We've talked about it on the podcast many times. So part of the goal of my podcast is to introduce people to new concepts that will allow them to be fulfilled with their hobby in ways that doesn't involve going to buy another mouth to feed. Now this episode is perfect for that because Marley introduces us to the concept of nature journaling. Nature journaling is exactly what it sounds like, drawing nature, drawing and painting nature, but also taking notes. And it is a, an incredibly accessible way to interact and learn about your animals in your own home and also the animals that are outside or just nature in general outside. And it you do not have to be a good artist. You actually can be a horrible artist to get started in this. And I've already started doing it myself. And I hope this episode motivates everybody to do the same. So in this episode, Marley talks about what exactly nature journaling is, how he got into it, and then some tech techniques that he uses to successfully do it on a regular basis. Marley talks about some incredible places he's done nature journaling in. He shows us examples of how to get certain detail or how to actually separate the animal from the detail, which is something that makes no sense right now. But when you listen to the episode, that will make sense. Marley also lists out all the equipment that he uses, very basic different types of pens, a sketchbook and the watercolors that any of us can go to a local art store or Amazon and pick up and start nature journaling basically right away. Now, if you are listening to this on the audio only platform, Spotify or Apple, Marley does spend a few minutes, maybe seven or eight minutes throughout the episode showing us some of his sketchbooks and they're absolutely beautiful so I do hope to encourage you to come back to the YouTube version or to go to the YouTube version after you're done listening to check those out or you can just go right to his Instagram page everything he shows us on this episode is also on his Instagram page and as a reminder if you're looking for more information on this episode or any other episode make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com there you'll find the show notes for each episode that has been recorded and you can also find a link to our website where you can or our link to our shop where you can find t-shirts and sweaters $5 for every t-shirt or sweater is donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash animals at home if you would like to support us monthly on a financial basis I do really appreciate every single person who does that and finally thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. There are affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you do make a purchase through there, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And I think that's it. Let's jump into this episode and I promise you will be motivated to do some drawing in a sketchbook, maybe while listening, but if not while listening, definitely afterwards. Enjoy. Perfect. Well, Marley, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm really grateful to be here. Well, I'm excited to chat with you. Obviously, I was on your show back in the fall, I think. It was a very, when I think one of the very first things I did after moving to my new space. So, so that was really cool. And I, I want to break down the show and learn more about what you're doing because you are in this very specific niche that's really interesting. So we're going to tackle that uh, eventually. But I want to know first, you have a love for nature, obviously, and obviously a love for art and you're amazing at art as well. So did one of those pop up first in your life? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the like oldest stories about me from when I was a kid is like, I grew up in San Diego, California and my mom, I don't have a memory of this story, but my mom came outside and I was like a toddler and, um, I was like 
there was like a crawl space under the house um and near the entrance to the crawl space i was like sitting there holding like a huge tarantula and my mom's just like what what's going on and like freaked out so like that's one of my early memories and then another or like an early story about me and then another one is i had this drawing when i was a little kid um that showed what my house would look like um when i was an adult and there's like you know there's like a snow leopard and an ocelot and there's like an anaconda and a boa constrictor like living in the rafters and there's all these like lizards and, and like swings and aquariums inside the house so like the drawing and the nature um were like both like things that i was really into early on but i didn't usually combine them until much later so did you pursue one of those paths as a career or as an interest when did you go after art or go after animals at some point? Great question. So I think like growing up, I sort of had this idea that I wanted to be a biologist and, and you know, with family and stuff, like everyone would always be like, um, oh, he's really interested in animals. And, you know, we would go to the San Diego Zoo and I would be like pointing things out to people. Um, and I think that like at a certain point in high school, I started to develop like a math phobia and sort of, I started to kind of limit my ideas of what was possible in the world of science because I didn't feel comfortable like and um, good at math. And then I also had, and I think these are ideas imposed from outside, but I also had this idea that like art wasn't really something to pursue as a career. So I didn't even think about, I didn't even consider um, pursuing art um, as a career or as a field of study. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. So then how did nature journaling come in? How did you first discover nature? First tell us about how you discovered it and then we'll get in, because I'm sure people are like, what is nature journaling? We'll get into what that is, but I wanna know how it entered your life first. Yeah, totally. So um, I think for me, um, I ended up pursuing um, cultural anthropology and the, the social sciences and um, late in high school and early in college, I became really focused on um, just the a lot of the issues that were going on on the planet and just feeling like this huge responsibility to try to do something about that. So I ended up focusing on the way that humans connect to nature in terms of like producing food and what are sustainable ways to produce food and how have people been doing this for millions of years or um, you know thousands of years without destroying the planet um, so i studied that and then it wasn't until well after college um, where i um, learned about this science illustration program and I saw that people were doing science illustration as like a career and I didn't realize that was an option when I was a kid or when I was in high school and suddenly I was at a stage in my life where I wanted to make some changes and stuff and I decided I wanted to apply for a science illustration um, graduate program um, in Monterey Bay, California and so I did this like whole application I was like drawing every day um, and I didn't get into the program, but one of the alumni that I, I talked to, to, to help me, um, actually is one of the main initiators of the nature journaling movement. And so he started telling me about nature journaling and then I started doing that. And I realized that was even more interesting to me than, um, science illustration or like finished illustrations. And, and for the science illustration part it's almost like that's in some ways a not a dying art but it's almost resurging because i think so many of us know they may not realize what science art is but they'll see it they'll know it when they hear it it's you know old pictures from textbooks from like the 1800s where you have these incredibly detailed drawings and it's just this beautiful piece of art and then it but it has a purpose because it's you know labeled and there's a description and and a lot of times people are even using that as artwork to hang up in their homes right totally. and, and yeah. you know a page but of a textbook like, it never really died as much i think people just sort of assume that that, oh we have photography and all of this stuff now but like you know if you pull out one of your herping books it's very likely that like all of the things are illustrations of the animals and if they do use photos then the like diagrams of the hemipenes are probably an illustration so it's like at least something is drawn in most of those like and it's the same with all the medical textbooks so it is it has continued to be uh applied and useful um, technique for books and stuff. 
Yeah, that's so true. It's funny that you even say that because I kind of even forgot about how much illustration would be in each book. And and in in many ways, it's so much easier to interpret an illustration than seeing like a dissection. You open up an animal and like everything's the same color and it's not like, you know, the pink kidneys. And and so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's true. How does nature journaling and science, science illustrations, how does that differ then? Yeah, so the focus in science illustration is communication. Um, And that's basically it. And so um, you are trying to um, show important information. And like you said, with an illustration, you can choose how to highlight um, what is important. Whereas with photography, it's basically plagued by its truthfulness. And there's a lot of techniques that people are developing now where they can do things better. But like you can't really show someone what are the important features or like focus on the essentials, whereas with illustration, you can. But it's in science illustration is communicating that information. Nature journaling can be for communicating information as well, but it's more about learning. So, for example, when I go um, to someone's uh, reptile room with my nature journal, My goal isn't to create like a finished illustration showing what this species looks like. My goal is to like engage um, with that species and learn about it while I'm watching it. And so I might do, you know, like a dozen different sketches of the head. The animal might be moving as well. Um, I might do a couple little like color swatches where I try to capture what the patterns look like. I can write questions down, like all of the questions that I have that comes to my mind, I could write down quotes that the keeper says, you know, like if the keeper says something funny or like if they're feeding their animal, I could just be doing that as like a nature comic almost showing the whole process. So I feel like, and then that later I could show that to someone else, but it's like in that moment, the nature journaling is forcing me to learn. Um, and then it also forces me to pay attention to that, that organism or ecosystem for a longer amount of time. And then in the end, it can serve as communication, but it can also serve as memory. So like I have like almost 50 of these and I can go back to the time I was in Ecuador, look something up and be like, oh, this is what that snake in Ecuador looked like. And these were the plants and this was the date and this was the, you know, um, climate and everything like that. Well, and I can imagine how much more of a robust memory it creates going through that process rather than just snapping a photo because a, a photo is such a small, I mean, there's amazing photographers and I would never throw photography under the bus, but even for us as just regular keepers, you know, take out your iPhone, take a picture of your snake and then you can look at it. But instead sitting there and documenting not only what you're seeing, but also the entire experience and you're, you know, hi- highlighting different things about the animal. It probably just builds such a strong memory where you'll easily be able to go, oh yeah, yeah, I do remember that. I remember the questions that I had and I even have answers for some of those questions now yeah there's a lot of neuroscience studies about that and i think it's called the production effect but if you're just passively observing something or even just clicking um you know on your camera uh you will remember a certain amount but if you're doing something um productive especially with your hands it increases your your memory and recall of that event by a lot yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So how did you originally start? What were some of the f- initial ways you began nature journaling? Yeah, so um, really important for me was just getting like a sketchbook, a standard size sketchbook and getting a, a kit. So a nature journaling kit that's really easy to carry around um, because I used to carry like sketching supplies in my backpack and then I would just never take it out. So I got this messenger bag Um, like eight or nine years ago and it's just easy to flip around to the front of my body I can pull out my sketchbook um, and I can draw standing up which is super important so I can do all of my nature journaling standing up which allows me to be like hiking or I go to like zoos and aquariums and I just started um, mostly like around where I lived Um, and then I started going on like outings that other people were leading so I'm really into uh animal tracking, for example. So I would just go on these animal tracking trips and I would just be sketching and stuff the whole time. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things where I think people will think, oh, well, I'm not a good artist, so I could never do this. But I, it's 100% something that everybody could try and start. And I'm sure the progression from when you, even, even yourself, who already was a, probably a pretty good artist when you began, I'm sure your ability has improved, uh, progressed over the last few years. 
Yeah, that's a super important part. And as someone who teaches this, it's I've realized that that those mindset obstacles end up being like the main thing people need help with. And like for me, the worst word is talent. Like I hate that word and it makes me want to like slap people in the face when they come up to me and they're like, oh, you're so talented. And I'll be like, you know, nature journaling at the Baltimore Aquarium and they have like this awesome uh, emerald tree boa sitting on a branch and I'm like drawing it and people come up and they're like, oh, you're so talented. And basically what they're saying is they're dismissing all of the, I mean, I filled thousands of pages trying to do this. I've busted my balls like practicing over and over again. And if you see some of my pages, it's just like repetitive sketches of the snake's head like over and over again, just trying and trying and re repeating and repeating. And it's like, you know, the person is is basically dismissing that. And then they're also um, disempowering themselves is because they're coming up and part of them is like, oh, that is really cool. And then the very next thing that comes up in their mind is like, I can't do that because of this. And basically what they're saying is like, I popped out of my mom with a nature journal in my hand and I'm just drawing <laughs> Coralus Caninus like super easy because I just came out of my mom that way. And that's not true, you know? And, and then that makes it, that takes them off the hook though, because they're like, oh, I, I can't do that because um, he's talented. So like, I get kind of worked up about that kind of stuff. And I think it's like super, super important. Like, obviously some people do have certain like, you know, biological, like maybe slight advantage towards like maybe better vision or better like something, but it's so small and everything else is practice. And if you don't practice, you're not going to get better at something, you know? So um, for whatever reason, art is seen as like a non-teachable, like it's not seen as a skill. It's a, a lot of times in our culture, it's seen as like something that you're born with, like creativity or whatever. And I think that's a huge disservice. I think it is a teachable skill um, and anybody who practices um, and tries can get better at it. It's, it's such a good point to make. And I think partly is as a person who it doesn't practice art, we only see the finished products a lot of the time, right? So you just see somebody's finished, amazing portrait, like the TikTok 15 second video of them going from start to finish. And you just, you can't believe how someone could do that, but you don't see all the practicing. And, you know, even when I was talking to Adeline Robinson, one of the oh, amazing yeah. things was talking about, you know, warming up, like waking up in the morning and going through some sketches just to warm up. And me being a former athlete and also coaching athletes at this point, it is, it's so similar to that, you know, practicing it's all about practice. It's all about failing. And, and a quote that I really love is it's better to do something poorly than not at all. And that allows you to go, I'm going to just draw the worst snake I've ever drawn, but it's better than having a blank page. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let me show you a couple of my sketches of my snake. Um, yeah, let's see it. Because I'll, I'll, um, you'll get the idea of sort of the like repetition. Um, here, this, this journal has also from the Baltimore Aquarium, which was really cool. Um, I'll just say for anyone listening, Marley's going to show us some of his sketchbooks. So if you're listening in your car or you're working out or whatnot, just come back to the video at some point and we'll try to be as descriptive as possible. Yeah, I'll, but do I'll make as sure much, I time stamp. I'll do as much description as I can right now. Um, but basically, like right here on this page, you can see this is, um, this is my Amazon tree boa. Um, and you can see like, for example, with the head shape, I have probably right here at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven sort of attempts, just like quick sort of outlines trying to capture that shape. And then with the like sinuous body shapes too, it's like a snake's like body is so it's, it's just like such good practice for drawing. And I just keep drawing these over and over again And here in this one pose, like um, where my snake Astragalus is looking down, the head's like kind of pointing straight down and the body's like, I think this was on my table or something. And I just drew that head like multiple times. And then on some of them I've added um, the patterning and on some of them I just have the shape, you know? So it's like, it takes like a lot of, and then here already on the, the next page, I'm just doing more of the same um, just over and over again. And I'm, what I'm doing too is I'm not like putting too much, um, emphasis on like each one being like perfect. I'm letting myself like go over and over and over again. Mm. Um, and that really helps. And even like, um, even when I was at the Baltimore aquarium, you know, I did like multiple versions of this emerald tree boa. And then as soon as I got home, you know, it's like, look at this. It's like, I did like 10 of Astragalus's head 
one, two, three, four, five, six. I just over and over again, you know, like repeating or like my tarantula molted. So it was like a really weird shape, but I tried anyways, um, drawing it as many times as possible. And yeah, sometimes I do one where it's like more of a finished drawing. Like here you can see um, the emerald tree boa um, that they had at the Baltimore Aquarium and I did like color and everything. Um, but for me, it's like doing the repetitions and trying to like understand things like little by little zooming in um, and just doing tons of repetitions is really like the important part. And that takes the pressure off too. Cause like, mm -hmm. um, like I saw the interview, um, with Adeline, is that her name? Adeline, yeah, yeah. And it's like her, like her, hers are a perfect example of where like, if someone's scrolling on Instagram and sees her drawings, they're just going to be like blown away. And also like might be like intimidated and be like, oh my gosh, I could never. And like, that is a really challenging place to start. So I think like, you know, doing warm ups or like doing these repetitive sketches like I do is definitely like a good place to start. <laughs> Well, and there's also something for the viewer looking at a page that has all the rough work and the sketching and then the, the, the notes as well. There's some, it's a different experience, and I just love the way the page looks in, in some ways. I don't know what it is about looking at a page in nature journaling, but it is just so satisfying for me to look at. I'm, do you have any ideas? Or I'm not sure. Do you experience yeah, that as well? Yeah, no, 100%. I remember being a kid, and I would look at um, you know Leonardo da Vinci's like anatomical sketch pages, and it would just show like these skulls and these muscles and then it was all this writing and all these little little sketches on the sides and i was like this guy is awesome and then i saw the mona lisa and i was like that's boring like yeah i'm not interested in the you know and it's like sure if you read a bunch of art history and you read like a biography of leonardo da vinci then you can appreciate the mona lisa but like for me like i would way rather look at his um, sketchbook pages um, and I find those like way more interesting and compelling. I think the combination of words and images, it's like graphic novels and comic books or you know there's some like amazing Japanese art or even like Mayan hieroglyphics where there's combinations of images and words in different like shapes and sizes and panels on the page and I think there's something visually compelling about that. Um, so I think you also maybe get like more of a view into the person's mind and thought process and it's more of like a narrative story like i love comics and i think comics can be like a really powerful way to tell a story about something that's happening as opposed to just like one single illustration mm -hmm. yeah that, that was my sense as well that you get this whole experience of what of, of watching the 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 process unfold on the page rather than just seeing the finished product you get to watch the artist kind of go through the steps and i think that's fascinating so but, but i do want to kind of flesh out what nature journaling is a little bit more right away but before or maybe we can do that by you letting us know how do you utilize it what are some examples you've kind of mentioned a few but on a on a week-to-week -week basis how are you using nature journaling in your life yeah totally so i use it all the time um let me see if i have another good example here um I think that it can accelerate your learning about anything. Um, so I think that it's like a really powerful way to just help you pay more attention. Um, and also when you put your thoughts and what you're noticing onto the page, it makes it more objective. So like you're less attached to um, your, you, you can, you can like reflect on your, your thinking more easily and notice like when you're wrong, for example. So like you might be looking at something, um, and thinking like, oh, that's a, you know, you might be misidentifying a species, for example. And then as you draw it more, suddenly you're like, wait, now I'm noticing like that it has a different number of scales, like around the eye than what I thought. And maybe it's actually like, uh, a different species so it can help you with that or it could help you you know like with your keeping for example it could help you just sit there in front of your terrarium and just like pay more attention for longer and notice things you know like one of the things i'm really interested in about herpetoculture is like how it can inform and be like more applied so like for example like there's all of these behavioral things that people who are um keeping herps can notice that no one has seen in the wild before and these behaviors have never been reported before. So like 
even if you're just writing those things down on paper, like the time, the, the temperature, you know, the species and what the behavior is, that's already like scientific information. So even if you don't have like some crazy drawing going along with it, it's like, it's very possible that you're um reptile keeping is like you're making observations that no scientist has recorded before so like a nature journal could be in its simplest form just like notes about that and if you have the location the time um, and the behavior like that's basically data so um, that is one example in addition to nature journaling about like my own animals or other people's you know when i visit my friends i i like to visit people or even looking on their Instagram and YouTube, nature journaling from other like um, other people and seeing like what animals they keep. But for example, uh, me and Roy attended the reptile preservation party last year. Um, and during everybody's talks, I just tried to, you know, like, well, I sketched them and then tried to, you know, like write down some of the important quotes or do like little diagrams and stuff like that. Um, so like there was, uh, what's his name? Nick Gordon from the Abronia Alliance. So I just tried to do like basically these sketch. I was really excited about this guy I was going to talk about like eyelash vipers or something, but that one got canceled. But yeah, I just tried to, you know, use nature journaling as a way to help me like pay attention. And during like that whole conference, I could just be focusing on taking these notes. And now when I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, like that's what those weird kafotis look like. And I have like a way better record of it. Oh, here's another example of like nature journaling your own like herps is like I tried for a long time. I never tried drawing like my snake when it was eating. Um, and I've been trying to draw things like that that are more challenging, like where the shapes are weirder and stuff. So I did the I nature journaled the whole process and I have like these timestamps. So like 730 p.m. This is what was happening. And I think this was the first time that I fed my tree boa a bird um it was a quail and so it was like a really interesting sort of learning process for the snake and i just tried to record all of that um and it was like a really interesting experience because like parts of it too are like you know like the the snake looks like in really unexpected ways like while they're eating something and i think that's something that usually people just draw like okay here's the snake from the side and like there's the head and that's like really easy but like it can be hard sometimes when you're trying to draw these like weird aspects, but you know, you can learn so much more about it. And this ended up being like kind of emotional for me because I think I was actually doing an Instagram live while I was drawing this. And there was like a one hour, there was like a one hour period where the quail was just stuck um, in Astragalus's mouth. And I started getting all like stressed out and like, I was like at the point of like Googling, like what to do if your snake's like choking on its food. Uh, and I was like all stressed out and I hadn't eaten dinner and I was just like drawing and like it was an Instagram live. Um, and then finally at 918, um, it passed through and I was just like super excited. Um, but it's just like really funny to like, you know, process those kinds of things like on paper. Um, and being able to nature journal it, I think just makes it um, way cooler. Let me show you a page where I've nature journaled someone else's um, herps real quick. Sure. Um, Cause that's something else that I like to do. Um, sometimes if I'm just, and this is a cool thing that people could do who maybe, this is another thing I'm really interested in is just like herpetoculture, I think can turn into like this Pokemon, um, you know, consumer thing where it's just like, you're just like because there's a big dopamine rush when you get something new and i think that that can be really dangerous and we can delude ourselves about it um and say like no like this uh, this i'm doing it for this or that reason but sometimes it's just like conspicuous consumption and it's like who has especially with social media it's like who has the most badass reptile room with like the most stuff and so i think nature journaling can actually be like uh outlet for that so like for example i was checking out um i think it was after your interview i learned about reptiliatus mm -hmm. um and so i was like watching his instagram reels and i just instead of me thinking like oh shoot i need to get some of my own dart frogs i was like how about i just like spend a couple hours nature journaling his dart frogs and get a little bit of that feeling of like okay that was like 
that was cool. That was fun. And um, you can see I take the pressure off of the individual drawings here too. And there's like a lot of attempts. Um, and sometimes I just focus on the leg or just focus on the color. But this was like a good opportunity for me to like engage with someone else's content. Um, I also snakes on Sam. She's also on Instagram and I like this photo of one of her, I think these are like those milk frogs or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just did, and this is a little bit more on the illustration side. Um, so I just did like a drawing of that. Cause I also wanted to get one of these too. My first reaction was like, oh, I want to get one of those. And then I was like, maybe I'll just draw it um, first and then see how I feel after that. <laughs> well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And that was one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you because I'm always looking for ways to break that dopaminergic response that we all get stuck in where you want to buy a new animal and do and exactly like you said and i've talked about on the podcast before is so many keepers get stuck in that cycle and you start to not appreciate your animals that's just what happens because you want another one and want another one and nature journaling 100 percent would be an outlet to to reappreciate what you already have and to learn more about what you have yeah. and it, i think that i think it's a perfect solution for really anybody in that scenario yeah totally and then you can also you know like um, like if you can't get, if, you know, if you can't afford, you know, a green tree monitor or whatever, or any like monitor, you can go to the like zoo and they have like, there's a Komodo dragon. So like sit there with the Komodo dragon and nature journal it at the zoo. Um, and you know, like most people have like zoos or amazing collections near them and you can go be near those animals and interact with them. Um, Obviously, I still someday want to have some pet monitors, but hey, for now. <laughs> well, and it's funny the way um, you can almost hack your brain in that way. It, you you desperately want to buy it, go out and buy a new animal, and then you draw it. Or even, even sometimes I've I've just purchased a book on a species that I want yeah. to buy rather than mm -hmm. trying to go buy a, a, an actual animal. And then all of a sudden, I don't really want to buy the animal anymore. I'm, I'm happy with the book. You kind of get that excitement of buying something and then it's solved. And I could see why drawing would, would be the exact same. And, and then I also assume that you do lots of nature journaling out in the wild as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm trying to think if I have some good ones here. Um, I do a lot. All of these books that I have here have pages. The thing is, is a lot of times you can't get that close to, um, you, you don't, all, well, actually here's some herbs out in the, in the wild. Um, this is actually just in my backyard and these are some fence lizards. Um, and I was just trying to watch them. They're moving a lot, but I was also trying to show this brick wall, um, where they were displaying and how they were moving around on there. Um, so that is like an example. Um, and when I'm out and about, let me see if I can find one of my um, pages from, uh, I should find some of my pages from like Ecuador or something. Well, and as you look, I'll, I'll mention something else. I assume yeah. that, you know, you, you showed that one image of you drawing the, the Amazon tree bowl while it was eating and saying it was in different shapes and whatnot. And, and I bet that's really good practice for when you go to, into, the nature, into nature and draw animals in the wild because they're not going to be in that perfect position. They're not going to be a photo. You have to draw them in weird positions from a weird distance. Yeah, 100%. So like before I go places, I like to practice. Like I went to Tanzania two times. And before I went, I drew, I got a field guide to the mam. I decided I would focus on mammals because um, it's, you know, the Serengeti is a good place to look at mammals. So, um, I mean, mammals are cool too, you know, like obviously like herps are the best, but, and fish are really cool. But um, anyway, so I got a book about mammals and I drew, I looked at the ranges um, and before for the, for, I think it was like four or five months before the trip, I drew every single uh, mammal that would be in the part of Tanzania. I drew every single mammal that was like supposedly in Tanzania um, in advance of the trip. And I like looked up their skeletons and their their tracks and their poop and all of that and did um, that before. So um, that helped me when I was there because yeah, in the field, things are like moving um, a lot faster usually. Um, and the conditions are just like way more challenging. So yeah, yeah, no, that's amazing. And that's good. another example of practice, practicing before you're going out there and how important it is to learn how to draw the shapes and whatnot and, and draw it from different angles. And what about, um, I, I'm not sure, did you find a, an example of the Ecuador ones? Um, if you didn't, yeah, it's okay. let me pull. let me pull them out. Sure. Um, all right, so when I was in Ecuador, well, the cool thing was in Ecuador, this was also, um, 
I mean, I did a lot outdoors in Ecuador, but they also had this amazing like herb collection. It's called the it's called just the vivarium um, in Quito, and it's part of like a whole um, research organization. And so I went there because it's in Quito in the capital before I went out into the field and I got to just see tons of like crazy bothrops and um, they had a, a boa arcoides, a rainbow tree boa, epicrates. Um, they had caiman. And one of the things I started doing there was this um, concept of just focusing on the pattern separate from um, the, the form. So like here on the, the emerald tree boa, I didn't even draw the pattern. I just focused on the form because the thing about like most snakes pattern is that it's actually the pattern is designed to um, hide the three dimensionality of the shape. But when you're drawing, you're trying to create the illusion of three dimensionality. So when you start doing both of those things, they're kind of like at counter purposes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I created this system for separating out the um the pattern from the volumetric shape of the snake so like here you can see the um, emerald tree boa um this was the i think this is the terciopelo or it's it's another bothrops another pit viper um the bushmaster um this one in spanish they call equis because it looks like x's oh cool um so this was all like there this is a boa constrictor um, pattern that I tried to simplify out from the shape here um, and then let's see when I got out into the field these are some butterflies that I saw out in the field uh, you can see how I separate the like patterns and the shapes um, here is like birds and just rainforest out there uh, a lot of notes you can see a lot of notes um, here was also out in the field um, there in Ecuador birds and plants mostly it was raining when i was doing that one here there's some awesome bromeliads obviously i love this is one of the things i really love about um herpetoculture is like creating um terraria with like plants and bromeliads and mosses and orchids and all of that stuff is really fun just more birds uh this was also out in the field i was uh, i stayed with this um, indigenous group, um, the Sapara, and this was like their cooking method. So I drew that also. This was the uh, propeller that they use on boats um, yeah. in sha oh, shallow, so cool. yeah, it, the shallow Amazonian tributaries. Um, yeah, tons of bugs and stuff that I saw there. Oh, I got like some. There, they found this. This, this was all there was of this lizard. Um, it had been eaten by some type of eagle, they said. And so I just sketched, um, this was like one of the, I didn't get a ton of herps um, while I was there. Um, but this is one that I, I, I did get a sketch. Um, it helped that it was dead too, so it wasn't moving. So I yeah. could like focus on the, um, the fingers and noticing like that it had this really interesting skin flap here. Um, so there's a lot that you can learn uh, when you're paying attention to the thing and, and nature journaling it. Here was this really cool, there was lots of really cool mantids uh, that I got to draw. This one was just like hanging out on my nature journal page. I did go back to that vivarium later and did a ton more snake drawings. And I'm actually gonna be going down to Ecuador this year and collaborating with that um, group at the vivarium in Quito. And I'm also gonna be collaborating with Tropical Herping there you've probably seen them on like instagram and stuff they um make a lot of field guides for ecuador and other places in south america and um, so yeah, i'm going to yeah. try to go along with them as they're like looking for new species and stuff and i'm going to try to be like nature journaling um along with them so oh that is incredible yeah how how meditative is it for you because it's, it's it seems to me that it must have a, a pretty powerful benefit that in that domain yeah, that's really funny. A lot of times, like, because I do watercolor is one of the main things I do. And like, sometimes people like old ladies will come up to me and they'll be like, oh, watercolor, that must be so relaxing. But I'm all <laughs> like, I'm all like in this tensed up position, like trying to see this animal and I'm just like all stressed out. So like, I'm usually, I mean, meditative can have a lot of different meanings. Like, I think I can get into a flow, um, but I'm not like usually relaxed. I'm usually like, 
very like intense and Focused. like when I look at my videos, a lot of times I have like RBF and I'm just like, I look like my face <laughs> is like all like looks really intense and not like very nice. So um, I think some people get a meditative part and I sometimes get that, but usually I'm like very, uh, uh, it's more like uh, an athletic event for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would consider that almost meditative as well, like the ability to just remove other things. You're not worried about bills and all this extra stuff yeah. that everyone has so much anxiety with. You don't. You're not thinking about your to do list. You're just. You're. It's a performance, like you said. You're actually focusing on one thing, and and it really that sort of forces you to do that. Yeah, and and for me, like one of the things that I found is like extreme nature journaling helps me focus. So like if I'm in if I'm on like a jungle cliff in Costa Rica, like I was just a couple weeks ago, um, and there's like waves crashing on both sides, there's like bromeliads and orchids and like strangler figs and like, you know, scarlet macaws flying everywhere and like um, leaf cutter ants and biting ants and stuff. It's just like, I have to be like way more, it forces me to like, be like in the zone whereas like if everything is if i'm just like at home like looking at pictures online it just doesn't really it's not it's just a lot harder so let's talk a little bit about how someone can get into this you know we've mentioned a few things but you know people are listening right now they might go oh you know what if this is something that i would be actually interested in attempting to do at home so you you mentioned the sketchbook is there any specific sketchbook or just blank pages or, or where do we start yeah i mean i really like these um stillman and burn sketchbooks um but i don't think that and part of why i like those is because um what i found is just like i fill more pages when i'm using these um so having that big paper like it helps me like fill more pages so i think that everybody's going to be different so like what works for me might not work for everybody but you need to have a metric of of how to decide if it's working so like if you're filling lots of pages, it's working. If you're not filling pages or not even pulling out your art supplies or like you're intimidated because they're too nice or like you need to have everything perfect before you even open up that sketchbook, then that's a sign that it's not working. So like these work for me because they're really big and they fit like I can draw with them standing up very easily. Um, and this paper is just good enough to be able to handle watercolor. This is this crazy river in Ecuador. Oh, that's amazing. Um, it's just good enough to handle watercolor, but um, not like so thick that it's like really expensive. But one thing, one thing I've been experimenting with a little bit more is like smaller sketchbooks. So this, for example, is um, really small. It fits in your pocket. I took this to Costa Rica as well. This was this really cool. Um, it looked like a fence lizard genus on the beach. And um, something like this, uh, because it's small, I think it can be less intimidating for some people. And like, I mean, here, look at this. I'm just on when I had extra time, I'm just practicing drawing these like boxes that are sort of like reptile heads just to get used to it. Because when you see the animal in the field, you only have like a few seconds to draw it sometimes. So just practicing those shapes. But like a little book like this, um, I think would be good for someone. And if you just had something like this, next to your uh, vivarium, for example, and you just create a habit of like, say, um, this is another trick is to make it a piggyback habit. So like, say you, um, I don't know, like drink coffee or drink tea every afternoon or every morning and you sit and you look at your animals or whatever, or you, you feed your animals at a certain time, like just leave this next to your um, in your reptile room. And every time you do that, maybe just do like one sketch and even if it's just like you know you just drew the feet like you tried to draw two feet on one of your geckos or something um and then just be like okay i filled that you know i filled that page i did it that one time and then the next time you do you know your feeding or whatever just pull it out again and you know if you put down the date and say like what you fed or if you already have a record keeping system just start like building off of something that you're already doing Mm -hmm. Or if you're field herping, you could do that too. But like everything in the field starts getting more complicated because if you're field herping, carrying stuff with you is gonna be a little bit more challenging too. Um, But like I've been field herping with Roy before and we're like finding like baby rattlesnakes and I'm like trying to draw the baby rattlesnakes. And that's like, 
that's really good too. And I love that, but I think starting in um, your reptile room would be a great place. I mean, people well, don't realize, like I've gone to people's houses before and checked or checked out people's collections before and people don't realize it's just like the amazing like beautiful biodiversity like in their house that's like a treasure trove for me like i could like mm -hmm. at your place i could just spend all day nature journaling in your place well and, and that's the thing is we become desensitized almost to what we have in our own homes because it becomes routine it becomes a, a cleaning um feeding changing the waters and whatnot and nature journaling allows you to reconnect with what you already have done you know we've already done the work and and it's way more accessible than art that that was one of the things when, when we talked to adeline people just look at that and they're, like he said their jaws are dropped they want to get into art but there's just it just such seems like such a far step where nature journaling is a perfect step into that creative world with no pressure yeah i think so i i absolutely so what about uh, utensils, mediums? You're talking about using watercolor. I have no clue how you're using watercolor in the field. That seems incredible. And for those that are listening, you'll have to come back and look at, at uh, Marley's work because it's amazing, especially those watercolor. But is there a specific medium that's best to start with or is it just kind of up to each person? Yeah, I'm a huge proponent. I used to use pencil a lot. Like these pages, a lot of these pages from Ecuador were actually with pencil and I had to go back over them or some of them you can't even see. Um, you can't even see the drawings because the pencil is so light. And I think pencil is really dangerous for people who are like perfectionists because you never commit. So now I'm a huge proponent for ink and just starting with ink right away and getting like really dark ink and just going for it on your first attempt. Um, oh, here are some more pages from from Ecuador of those like snake patterns and stuff. So but, cool. Yeah, it's like, I mean, a freaking boa constrictor's pattern, you could spend, I mean, obviously like Adeline is drawing like every single scale, but even just without the scales, the pattern is so complex and it changes on different parts of the body. It's just, and then here's one just without the pattern at all, you know, that was, oh yeah, that was boa constrictor too. Mm -hmm. um, and so like now what I do is I go straight I go, I start with ink, um, ink pens, and there's so many different ones, but I really like these Pilot Fudayaku pens. Um, I think people use them for like anime and stuff, and it has gray on one side and black on the other side. And this is like my main drawing tool. And then I also really like these, um, these fountain pens, these Japanese fountain pens. They allow you to put down a lot of black ink really fast um and also do fine lines and they're really fun and then i have uh, everything in this kit so i can just swing it around to the front of me open up the top it's like a messenger bag um, i can pull out my sketchbook um, hold my sketchbook in one hand and then my watercolor palette is a field palette so you can hold it in one hand um, as well and this palette has been to the serengeti twice it's been um, almost dropped in the amp in a tributary of the Amazon and cloud forests in Costa Rica. And then I have these water brushes for watercolor that hold the water inside. These are pretty common now, but this is essential oh, cool. because you don't have to carry water with you and it allows you to do everything standing up. So I can be standing, I can be in a tree on a canoe, um, kneeling, lying on my stomach, um, anything like that. Um, that is incredible. It looks it looks cumbersome to the person that, that that's watching. Like, I just got so much going on. I can't believe how well you can draw and paint while doing all of that. You, you have to practice. So, like, I, I really practice um, in the field a lot. And um, it just make the more you can you can practice keep getting things like simple and testing out what materials work for you and what systems work for you. Um, the more you can do that, then it allows you to be in the field. So, um, like all of this was done in the jungle in Costa Rica. Those are taper tracks. Uh, you know, it was like, sometimes it was like raining on me. There's like mosquitoes biting me. Um, I saw these tapers, uh, mom and baby. I did some herping, but didn't really find that many. Uh, next time I didn't have enough money to go on like one of the guided trips or whatever, mm -hmm. but you can see on these pages, lots of birds and plants. Um, and I only got, I mean, I got some toads, I think a couple times, um, and some snakes and stuff at night. And then when I went to Reptilandia, oh, here was a really, this was probably one of my best, like 
um, herbs in the field. Yeah, I was up in this tree. And so I just drew this standing up. It was right next to a soccer plaza. Um, and it was up in this tree and I was using, I have binoculars also. So I'm like looking through the binoculars. Oh and drawing. That's crazy, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So are you adding the watercolor in the field as well? Or yeah. do some of it you do afterwards? I try to do, I'm really lazy. Sometimes if I, if I say, oh, I'll add this afterwards, I get home and I don't do it. And when you're on a trip like this, you can, it's really easy to, at the end of the trip, have like 20 pages where you're supposedly going to go back and add watercolor. But it's like, how are you going to be sitting in the like hotel adding watercolor when there's like more animals and stuff happening outside? So it's like for me, the like stuff that's happening live is really what, um, what I want to focus on. So let's say somebody is just trying to get into this. We we could use me as an example, someone who is not a good artist i have not practiced enough at all so what what would be some tips for somebody who's like what are things that you look for with an animal i mean it will start with you know in your own home collection because it's a lot easier are there certain aspects of detail that you look for like how, how does somebody go about because i think it's almost intimidating okay i'm going to draw an entire snake well no let's not start with the whole snake is there certain areas that you say focus on first to practice yeah that's a great question so i would say you can get um bogged down in like the decision making and sometimes you just have to arbitrarily sit down especially like you know if you're at like a collection where there's so many things it can be easier just to go like like if it's not your collection you just go with your phone and take photos of everything or like you know i've nature journaled at um reptile shows before too and that's like a real fun experience dang i should have gotten that book out um it's been a couple years now but that's a great place to nature journal but like you just sometimes have to arbitrarily decide or else you're going to walk around the like expo and just be like, oh, that animal, do I want to draw that one? And if you spend 30 minutes without pulling out your sketchbook, you're probably just doomed. Like, so mm-hmm. the best thing to do is if you decide you're going to do it, pull out the sketchbook like on the first animal or just make a total arbitrary decision um, and just start putting stuff on the paper because that's the hardest part is just getting started. And if you start walking around or trying to decide which animal you should draw, um, that's going to be hard. But like, you know, if you just draw whatever is visible, like, you know, a lot of my animals will be like partially hidden. So it's like only some of that animal is visible or like these snakes right here. I don't even remember what um, Seudis sulfureus. This is something that was at that, um, you know, it's like the animal is partially hidden. So it's like you just draw what you can. Mm-hmm. Or if you want, like one thing that could be um, fun for you is to try to do these pattern things where you just focus on trying to get the pattern of the snake um, separate from like the shapes of it. And then like you can see here that this snake, I think this is probably one of the bows again, but I'm focusing on like the head mm-hmm. in a couple different positions. It's moving heads a lot of times heads and feet on animals um are things that i sometimes focus on and if you can just practice getting like a reptile head in a bunch of different perspectives i think that can be like you know make you feel more empowered about your ability to draw them yeah and and for those who are listening some of these sketches are literally just a basic outline it's not it doesn't look like a super complicated thing it's a very very basic outline just to get used to drawing the shape and and so what about color what are some other options other than watercolor to add color to the page i'm sure not everybody would want to use the paintbrush yeah i mean i as soon as i got as soon as i got this watercolor palette i just like i used to have boxes of of different markers prisma colors i had a bunch of expensive pencils colored Mm -hmm. pencils you know, like huge su- amounts of supplies. And it's like, you can't really bring those into the field unless even if you're like Rambo with like all of these like things <laughs> yeah. strapped onto your chest, it just doesn't work. And like inside of this teeny little palette, I mean, this thing would fit, you know, it's like two, it's like twice the size of my wallet. And like with this and one of those water brushes, I can basically achieve like an infinity of colors. I don't know if you can see this right here this is just like all the two-way crosses that are possible with my watercolor palette so this is just combining two colors and this is probably the most did you make that yeah i did it took so so long um to make this and i think there's almost 1000 um combinate it's like 900 something two-way combinations and that's all from that one watercolor palette and then that's not even if i mix three colors 
Um, so like, I just think that watercolor is, it's so much faster and it's so you're, you can do such big, you can do big washes with it. Um, and you don't have to carry a bunch of like pencils. I, you know, I've done colored pencils, but like at this point, I'm just, I'm just over it. You know, like I, there's certain very specific things I might try colored pencils for, but for the most part, it's like, you can't do, um, these big wash. It's just slower. You don't have as many color options. Um, it's just not, I'm not really interested in going back to them. Well, and one thing that I think just from observation from my side, it looks like with watercolors, you can be almost messy with it and then go back or, or when you're starting with that ink pen, the detail and the lines just draw it all together. So even if the watercolors, you know, escaping the actual piece, it doesn't matter because the ink holds everything into the eye and it still looks incredible. Yeah, exactly. I try to, I try to work really fast and I try to focus on like what I call, a um, uh, what do they call in engineering? They call it, a um, it's not resilient. It's a um, fault tolerant. I try to have a fault tolerant drawing style because it's like I'm I'm in the Amazon. Like a bird could poop on my page, or this whole thing could fall in the river, and it's like something could be biting me, and I could spill a little bit on here. So it's like having a fault tolerant style will make it so that like even if something a little bit goes wrong, you can still see um, what's happening on the page. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, that, that sort of eases the pressure of you know feeling like you can't make a mistake. The book is for mistakes almost. It's just get out there and go. The next page can can be the correction if, if you need to you know redraw something. Exactly. So let's. I I know you have tons on your YouTube channel as well for people learning. So we can I can leave a lot of that to you for your channel. I want to talk about the YouTube channel as well, but I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the the trip to Costa Rica. You just came back from Costa Rica and you had checked out Reptilandia, which I think I had actually told you about. Yeah. I I've never been there, but I was I was there. I was in Dominical and I didn't even know about it until I got home. I'm like damn, I should have gone. <clears throat> so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was it was really cool, and um, you told me about it, and then I think Roy told me about it afterwards. But as soon yeah. as you told me about it I put it onto like my Google Maps um, and I luckily was able to go and I didn't have a car so I just tried to figure out what I was like looking on Google Maps of like would I be able to walk on this road and then I ended up getting like the closest hotel to Reptilandia um, and uh, I asked them on Facebook like can you walk to Reptilandia from your hotel and they're like yeah no problem and then um, when I got there, it was sort of the last thing on my trip. So I had been trying to put in some, you know, night hikes and stuff at all the other places where I had been. I had seen like a few snakes um, and lots of cool lizards and frogs for sure. Um, but like I also it was just a little bit too. I never really got any nature journaling in. Like I do have a setup for nature journaling at night and I want to practice nature journaling during um, field herping at night. Um, but I didn't, it was just like too many, you know, things like I'm wearing like boots, headlamps, oh, yeah. like mosquito gear. And it's just like really humid and it was hard enough. And I had a really bad knee injury the whole, like the whole trip in Costa Rica. It was super muddy. Um, so like Reptilandia was like, okay, like whatever I don't see, um, you know, in the field, I could check out at Reptilandia and draw it. And, um, I ended up getting there and the road was super sketchy. So it was only like 800 meters or a kilometer between my hotel and Reptilandia, but it was like this narrow, narrow curving road. Obviously people drive crazy in Costa Rica. There's like huge trucks yeah. passing other trucks. Um, and it was just like this steep drop off on the sides. And then I was also a little bit sick. Um, so I got a little bit sick, like right at the end of my trip. Um, so anyways, it was like, it was a major effort to get to Reptilandia and <laughs> I, um, I drew their, uh, crocodile. They had an American crocodile. Um, I did a quick sketch of the Komodo because it's the only Komodo in Latin America. And I thought that was cool, but I ended up sort of like walking around a lot and having that same issue that I mentioned before, where you're not sure what to start with. Yeah. Um, they have a ton of cool they have a lot of repeats of things. So like they have a lot of um, Coralis hortolanus and cool color morphs like um, orange ones and stuff. 
and they have a lot of the um, neotropical pit vipers, but many of them were sort of like hidden um, and um, the enclosures were really well done, um, especially for, you know, like a zoo in Latin America. And they had like a really cool, they had all this really cool stuff where like there is roofs covering things, but then you could like um, pull like a chain and then the the roof would move and allow sun and uh, rain to go into the enclosures. So that oh, wow. a lot of the enclosures, I don't think they hardly had, you know, artificial lights on almost anything. I think they had some supplemental heat lamps, but um, they're relying on sunlight for the plants. And, you know, there's like margravia, like growing outside of the enclosures and just like on the walls. And that's just like yeah. that kind of stuff just makes me mad because I'm like <laughs> struggling to grow moss and margravia and like epiphytes and my own stuff. And it's there. It's just like growing on the ground. It's just like weeds outside. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but, so it was like really cool and it was quiet <clears throat> while I was there. Um, lots of lots of cool animals. I didn't get a ton of great pages. Um while I was there, but I did take some video and, you know, got as much like nature journaling in as I could. Cool. Yeah. Well, if I'm ever back in that area, I'll definitely have to check it out as well and see if I can manage the, that twisty windy road as well. But, uh, yeah. no, that sounds amazing. And so let's talk about the YouTube channel because it's something I'm not, maybe you let us know when you started it and, and kind of what the motivation was to start it. And then we'll talk about the content that's on there. Yeah, so I I started a while ago, but I was just posting sort of random stuff, like whatever I was doing. Like I even did some like um, terrarium builds, like background builds and stuff like that. Um, and I think I did a unboxing when I got my snake. Um, and uh, but then I switched to make my channel just all about nature journaling. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's just all about nature journaling. The channel name is still just Marley Pfeiffer, my name and I do a lot of live shows. I interview people. Um, I do live shows with people like you. I've done some with other um, like reptile keepers or people who have like animals or a lady that had like um, was really into looking at stuff under a microscope and we were trying to draw stuff under the microscope. Um, I interview people who are um, doing like science illustration, botanical illustration, people who are nature journaling in different parts of the world. Um, people are nature journaling like extreme conditions in Alaska. So a lot of interviews and then I do videos when I travel and nature journal in the field or I, I've nature journaled at a couple um, prescribed burns and forest fires and um, nature journaled, um, you know, at the ocean, on a kayak at night, um, at the zoo, stuff like that. So all of that stuff goes on to my um, channel and um and yeah, that's sort of like the main, that's sort of like my main focus right now is my YouTube channel. I do a lot on Instagram as well, but the YouTube channel is the main thing. I also review gear. I have like a lot of how to's and tutorial videos for nature journaling. Well, and it seems like you built up a, a pretty nice little community there as well. And you're fostering nature journaling to people. People are coming to you to learn how to do it. And and I remember when I was on your show, I think maybe even off air, you were telling me about there was a, a, a young subscriber that you have who's like very dedicated towards nature journaling. Can you talk a little bit about them? Because that would just give a good insight yeah. of the type yeah, of community there's this you're kid, There's this kid in London um, and he comes to all since COVID, he started nature journaling and he comes to all of these classes and online events, which are like at crazy hours for him. So we had a nature journaling conference um, last year in the summer. And um, this kid was there. They were going like all day. And, and most of the, the people are in California. Um, so everything was sort of on California bias time. And this kid would be there and then you'd suddenly realize it's like four in the morning yeah. at his place and he's like nine or ten um, and he's just like nature journaling the whole time and he, he he's really into herbs and stuff. I mean, he doesn't keep any herbs, but um, he's really into nature journaling them. And I think he showed up when um, you were on my show to draw snakes mm -hmm. and some of your animals. Um, but yeah, there's there's some kids, but for the most part, it's not it's for the most part, it's sort of older people. Um, that are into it, but I'm trying to get more um, younger people into it and and more applied uh, nature journaling. So like, for example, like seeing crossovers too with like herpetoculture and trying to foster those sort of um, intersections with other fields and hobbies is what I'm super interested in. 
Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. And I'm hoping that this will introduce people to that concept as well, because you it, you do have a very, it's almost like a crash course on your YouTube. You can learn how to nature journal just through going through your videos. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Do you have any plans for the YouTube channel future wise? Like, do you have any, a long-term vision or is it just going to continue to do what you're doing right now? Yeah, I think, um, what I want to do is more like applied stuff. So I'm really excited about, um, going to Costa Rica and Ecuador next year. I'm going to be nature journaling in the Galapagos next year. And wow, that's I, amazing. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. And I just want to show how nature journaling can be used in all of these other applied ways and like how people who are, you know, doing prescribed fires, for example, can use it or how people who are ecologists can use it, or at least like get it to the point where it's like, when people are going on like a field herping expedition, um, you know, in the Amazon to look for like new species of frogs, like that they'll, in addition to like um, a map per a mapping expert, they could have like a nature journaling expert on their expedition. And that person would be helping, you know, document things and create like um, products for communicating the discoveries, but also just to have that person as an element of the team. So that's the kind of stuff like I would like to see in the future. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm really excited for it. I definitely am going to try this myself. I got to get myself a, a sketchbook. And, you know, I might even try the watercolors just for fun, just to see if I can do it. But I'll probably start with the pen or the ink. And, and like I said, and we kind of mentioned throughout the episode, I think this is a perfect way to get people to appreciate what they have on a deeper level and not get stuck into that, you know, constantly buying new things. And, and as you had mentioned too, who knows what can be discovered if you sit down and pay attention to your animals. There's just, you could, a whole world could unfold that you have been walking past for the last three years. Yeah, exactly. Or you might be, you might be aware of it, but it's not being like documented or shared with other people necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's so true. Is there anything else that we didn't mention today that you wanted to mention before we wrapped up? I, I, I love this episode. I'm really hoping it motivates people to get drawing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that um, I didn't talk about is just like how I got how like I got into herps like early on or like I mean, how I was obsessed with them when I was a kid or whatever. Yeah, let's talk but, about that. Let's let's talk about how how did you get into keeping in the first place? Okay, well, one thing that I one thing that's an early memory like that I think is like really funny when I reflect on it is you know how people when they see like a shooting star they like make a wish. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I just remember the only thing I would wish for was a Komodo dragon. And like <laughs> I would just seriously like I I just had this memory of seeing like a shooting star and like being next to my bed, like praying for a Komodo <laughs> dragon. And it's just like at that stage when you like have no like concept of what that actually means. Um, and so that was like really funny. And then the other thing too, that I think was like sort of different um, is like a lot of kids have all these like stuffed animals in their bed or whatnot. I had like all of these like snakes and like these little dart frog figurines and stuff. Awesome. And it, I didn't really know like what people were probably already doing with dart frogs at that point. But like, if I had known about like Troy Goldberg, like at that age or whatever, I would have just probably been so into that kind of stuff. So I just, I think it's really cool how things have evolved and how like, um, you know, like the planted naturalistic, uh, yes. area is just like really exploding and just like seeing that stuff. And like the scaping, like I could just spend like looking at driftwood or pieces of wood and moss and just trying to figure out, I feel like that is like a huge art form too. And that's like one of the things that I think is like so attractive about herpetoculture. And also the other thing that I think is really interesting is just um, the way that the role that herpetoculture can play in like our relationship to nature in general mm -hmm. and like the yes. direction our species is going in because more people live in cities now than don't live in cities and that has that just happened in the last five years and for the rest of like human history people have been way more in the outdoors and so i think like the this growth of like herpetoculture is a sign that people are trying to like connect with nature and and show that they like they actually love it and want to be close to it and i think just like I'm really curious about the ways in the future that maybe herpetoculture can be, um, you know, like a sustainable way for people to like 
see like the Amazon, like you've mentioned this, I think in other um, episodes before is like you, in a way you have like a piece of the yeah. Amazon and you don't have to necessarily like fly there 10 times um, or whatever, but like you can actually like have that nature um, there. And also just the fact that like XC2 conservation might become like important and like with certain species, like potentially going extinct in the wild, like what role can herpetoculture play? Um, and just like the awareness piece, I think all that stuff is like, I'm really interested in, in like seeing that side of the hobby, like growing and strengthening in the future. Well, and, and we don't really have a concept of how important it is to be connected with nature. We, we, we know that it feels good and, and we want to set up these enclosures. And when you go for a walk in the woods, it's great. But <clears throat> we don't know what it, what it could be like in 15, 20 years if people are completely removed from exactly. that experience. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think like in some ways, herpetoculture and just like just this idea of like creating like miniature enclosed ecosystems. Like I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of aspects of that that are going to be super important in the future. And it's hard to predict, you know, like the future, of course, like, and there's a lot of examples of people trying to create enclosed ecosystems and like live in them or whatever that have failed or have like all kinds of weird ethical issues. But like, I think there's aspects of like having enclosed ecosystems and understanding even just how like detritivores and nutrient cycling works and like like detritivores in um terrariums is like such an important thing and i think there's like so much to learn there and just the nutrient cycling um there's so much there that i think will be important in the future yeah i completely agree and what what do you keep right now as far as your your herbert culture at home yeah so i have um an amazon tree boa back in that terrarium there um and i have like a bunch of different like plants in there and detritivores and i have had um frogs in there in the past um i think i do like sort of a lot of controversial things i'll probably get like a lot of flack for it but i've definitely experimented a lot with um cohabitating um and i know a lot of people are gonna go crazy on me about that and then i also have um, experiment a lot with like bringing in things from like outside. So I do a lot of gardening and I, you know, like do a lot of like soil work outdoors. So I bring in my own detritivores. I haven't just like bought all of my soil from the bio dude and um, yeah. paid like 50 bucks for isopods and everything. Um, and then I also keep um, two species of California alligator lizards um, and they're little babies still um, in a smaller terrarium here. Um, and I also have that terrarium all planted out. Um, and then I have a gopher snake and a, um, uh, in this little enclosure here, um, it's just a small enclosure with some plants. I have an avicularia avicularia. So the pink toe tarantula, it's still pretty small. Um, but I have that one, um, in there. And yeah, I think like some of the, stuff that I'm interested in too is just like like the alligator lizards for example you know like those are um you know something that like not that many people keep and there's something that live it's an it's a species that actually lives like where I live and I think that that a lot of people maybe had started that way when they were kids or like 50 years ago that's the only kind like one of the only kinds of herpetoculture that people did but like I think there's just like this sort of weird disconnect in herpetoculture sometimes like there's a weird nature disconnect where it's like this idea that like all of the stuff in your terrarium should be something that you can buy online and gets like shipped to you and that that somehow makes it like sanitized and like clean and like okay whereas like if you go outside and like catch something um or go outside and get like a piece of wood and bring that into your terrarium like suddenly that's like oh my god like yeah. I understand like there's like ethical issues um, with like a lot of aspects of herpetoculture, but I think like I'm interested in learning and if herpetoculture can be a way for us to learn more, I think one of the things that we can learn about is like ethics and I think ethics is never like black or white, you know, and so like having this opportunity um, for yourself to think about it, but also for like when you talk to kids or other people about it, like, and they're like, whoa, why do you keep those? Or like, 
was that like wild before or like what do you feed it like is it alive when you feed it you know like all of those like sort of like gray areas of ethics i think like herpetoculture it's like we should be addressing those and talking about them um and realizing that it's like a gray area a lot of times and there's not just like this is the right and this is the wrong on those topics you know yeah, it's so true. It is. It's such a great vehicle for so many different discussions and, and to foster so much education within our community. And it, yeah, it, it does get so frustrating when you have a group of uh, people that want to completely remove keeping reptiles in general, yet, you know, use all the benefits of the fact that the rainforest is being chopped down. <laughs> you know, it's like we, we, we want to be able to educate people and learn about these different things and like you said maybe conservation in ex situ could be a legitimate thing in the future but having that connection to nature is so important and it's it's not as evil as it is is painted out to be in many ways yeah absolutely i think the evil if there's anything evil it's um house cats um killing <laughs> yeah. uh, native species that's something that i've really been uh come much more aware of recently well, that's an amazing thing where people don't think about that at all. And yeah. when you actually look at the numbers of how many animals house cats kill a year, it's really insane. Yeah, they kill a lot of native herps too. Yeah, yeah, lots of lizards, snakes. Mm -hmm. And they get they get a free pass where with reptile keeping, we don't necessarily. But yeah. it is probably one of the better hobbies for connecting with nature. Because especially if you're keeping, like you said, planting and, and you know, having a... a, a bioactive cycle and whatnot it forces you to interact with nature on a much deeper level and and i think nature journaling ties that in so perfectly and i, I hope that the p listeners want to engage in it as well because i think there's so much more we can do by adding that on to a common practice of herpetoculture like not everybody has to be a perfect artist but if we're all taking detailed notes and learning and it can level up the hobby in a way that we haven't done yeah totally well, Marley, I really enjoyed this. Like I said, I, I do want to actually start this as well myself. I think I would love to connect with my animals on a deeper level. And, and I actually used to really enjoy drawing when I was younger. I think most people enjoyed drawing Everybody. when they were younger. So, so I, I'm hoping to, I can get back into it. And, and is there anything else that we wanted to say before we wrapped up? Um, I don't think so. I think we covered everything. Can you let everybody know where they can find you online? I, I want to send people to your channel so they can learn how to nature journal as well. Yeah, uh, just if you go on YouTube and just search for Marley Pfeiffer and it's M-A-R-L-E-Y and then P-E-I-F-E-R. If you can spell my last name, you can find me anywhere online. And my Instagram too is Marley Pfeiffer. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much, Marley. I had a blast chatting with you. I really appreciate you spending the, the time with me this morning. Yeah, it's been super fun. All right, that is the end of that episode. Marley, thank you so much for stopping by. That was a great chat. Thank you for showing us your sketchbooks as well and also explaining how you do this. Like I said to the intro, I actually already did start some of this. I have a few sort of scrap papers that are on my desk where I'm just sort of sketching my snakes and my day, ge day gecko and whatnot. And I do love it. And uh, I'm definitely going to order some watercolors as well. I think it's such a good way to engage in the hobby in a way that is very productive. And like we talked about in the episode, if you're taking notes and detailed notes, who knows? what you're going to learn and I love it. Listeners, thank you so much for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments on YouTube. Are you going to start nature journaling or shoot us a message on Instagram uh, in the comment section on the on the post that's regarding this episode. If you are starting nature journaling, make sure you tag, you don't have to tag the pictures, but tag me and tag Marley so we know that you're actually starting to do that because I think we would both be super excited to see this completely spread across the hobby. It's again, a very, very positive way to use your time and engage with the hobby. And as always, if you're looking for more information on the podcast, Podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can also join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash animalsathome. And finally, thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. And I think that is it for this week. I probably won't see you guys for the next few weeks. As you know, there's some family things going on. I'm having a baby pretty soon. So the next couple weeks will probably be a skip if you want more information on that. I did mention it during the last episode. And until then, hopefully you guys have a good couple of weeks and I will catch you in the next episode.